Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is I, once again, your Madcap Prophet, here to talk to you today about uh, another episode of Pop Scripture, the show wherein we talk about literature and popular entertainment and what it can tell us about our lives. And today, we are talking about Sandy Mitchell's Caiaphas Kane, the hero of the Imperium. Kai, Kai, Caiaphas Kane, hero of the Imperium. Kai, Kai, Caiaphas Kane, hero of the Imperium. Sorry about that. That's a, a a reaction some of us fans have. You just, you have to do it. Um, so yeah, this is Sandy Mitchell's Caiaphas Kane for the Emperor, the first Caiaphas Kane novel. Um, and just for the record, well, I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, so yeah, as a reminder, what is pop scripture? What the fuck does that mean? Well, scripture is, you know, by definition, a body of writings considered sacred or authoritative. That's the, the important word, authoritative. What does it mean for you? What is an authority? Well, if the divine exists, the divine is part of everybody and thus can potentially speak through everybody. So anything that is created can thus be a connection to the to the divine, the authoritative. Um, whether it's a TV show that just speaks to you the right way or somebody who says the right thing you need to hear at the right time or turning on the radio and hearing the exact right song to get you going. You know, little serendipities. Um, but I understand that not everybody likes the whole God talk thing, and that's cool. Uh, basically, it's a way of saying, hey, there's some clever shit in this. There's some wise things here that we could learn from. You know, I'm not trying to put a whole lot on Sandy Mitchell, which I understand is a pen name. Um, you know, from from what little I know, he's a nice enough guy. Uh, but it's, you know, all I'm I'm not trying to, trying to say, oh, you're special, you're holy. No, just, well... Sure, but no more or less so than anyone else. Uh, but the point here being, you know, hey, you said some clever shit. Uh, let's see what it can teach us about how to live our lives. So that's where I'm coming from. I just use the God language to, to draw attention and possibly to decrease my numbership. Could be having an, ad, an adverse effect. Who knows? But yeah, that's where we're coming from. That's what we're doing here. So we are going to go through a summary. Here there be spoilers. If you haven't read this book, uh, go read it. I love the audiobook version on Audible. They're real good. All the Audible versions of Kane are really good. Um, then we will do some analysis, some themes, you know, your standard lit review. And then we will talk about how it's relevant to our daily lives, what it can teach us. So here we go. Meet Caiaphas Kane, a commissar in the Imperial Guard. Um, I'm going to assume you know a few basic terms from Warhammer 40k. If not, welcome. Uh, I'm a little confused why you're here. You know, I'm not upset that you're here, but uh, this I would think this is the kind of thing that attracts 40k fans more than anything else. But yes, there's the Imperial Guard. They're a big honking military unit with flashlights. Um, that's what they call their lasers or their las guns. Hyphus Kane is a commissar. If you don't know what that is, a commissar is a political officer, such as the USSR had in World War II. They were the guys who stood behind the troops with a bunch of machine guns, and if anybody tried to retre retreat, they shot their own people. So they're the guys in charge of shooting their own people to improve morale. Uh, that's the commissar, and in the Imperium, because it is a dystopic world, uh, they're a standard part of the military. And, you know, like, everybody has them. Nobody's, nobody questions it. Most of them are happy, but they don't question it. So Caiaphas Kane, already established as a hero of the Imperium, we are so informed, uh, the later stories flesh that out, arrives on a ship bound for the uh, the world of Gravelax, where there's trouble a brewing with the Tau, a very Asian-based or Asian-themed empire of blue-skinned aliens. Um, and the problem is, this regiment he's assigned to is actually two regiments. It was two different groups, uh, um, an all-male unit and an all-female unit, who both had to fight off a bunch of Tyranids, uh, evil bugs, think the Zerg from StarCraft, because StarCraft is 100% a copy of Warhammer. Like, it was going to be a Warhammer game, and then they couldn't get the licensing. So yeah, the Zerg, uh, big angry space bugs. Their units were decimated by them, just torn the fuck up in the uh, repulsing of these Tyranids from one of their worlds. And so the remains of the two half units were combined into one whole unit. 
except they have all their different traditions and you know history and one's all men and one's all women and they're both salty about that so there's a lot of shit going down it's a bad time like people are relieved to see the commissar show up to handle discipline that's how bad it is you know but when you're happy to see the political officer who shoots his own men you're in a bad situation uh but kane masterfully manages to get the worst of the troublemaker sorted start making them work together as a team and actually improving shit because he's a actually good at his job so these problems mostly handled uh he shows up on the world of gravelax they expect the world of gravelax to welcome them and help you know yay the heroes are here to drive off the evil aliens because again if you are not aware warhammer 40k is extraordinarily xenophobic and bigoted like hate the xenos is one of their creeds like that's a literal thing that they say xenos are evil because they're alien scum it's not a nice place. Uh, the, the common fan saying is, you know, Star Wars fans want to live in the world of Star Wars and be a Jedi. Star Trek fans want to live in the world of Star Trek and be on the Enterprise. Warhammer 40K fans do not want to live in Warhammer 40K. But yes, they show up on Gravelax, this world that has is kind of a border world. It's got a lot of Tau influence. It's also got a lot of Imperium or Terran influence. And neither side is really happy about that. And now things are starting to come to a head. Um, what's really weird is they show up, the Imperial Guard, expecting to be greeted as heroes. And instead, they're greeted by giant signs that say, Imperium, go home. And people throwing things at them in the streets and booing them. Now, a lot of people are happy to see them, but a lot are not. And they are wigged the fuck out by that. So, um, as it turns out, they start looking into uh, the situation. Things keep getting pushed to a head. He, Kane runs into some Tau and actually manages to survive the encounter and kind of make a friend. Uh, the Tau have this whole thing about the greater good that they believe is important. Um, Kane is at a party with Colonel Castine, his uh, commanding officer of the 597. And they're, you know, it's just a, a diplomatic soiree for all the mucky mucks and the fat, lazy, worthless governor is there who's an idiot and inbred. And some Tau diplomats show up because, well, diplomatic. And one of them gets shot. And nobody knows who did it, but everybody's on, on edge now. And then the city starts, like, rioting because they've heard that the Tau ambassador has been shot. Except there's literally no way that the city heard and started rioting in the two minutes that he's been shot for. So Kane quickly figures out shit is up. Um... They escape. The five, the the honor guard, and Colonel Castine and Kane, along with the Tau diplomats, get out of Dodge. They get the Tau diplomats back to their quarters, to their part of the city, which really buys them some favor and some goodwill. And then they start investigating what the fuck is going on because things are more suspicious than they seem. And suddenly, the Inquisition gets involved. The Inquisition, if you're not aware is the group of organization, the organization of individuals who, uh, well, kind of like the Spanish Inquisition, they do whatever the fuck they want, whenever the fuck they want, have the power to authorize, like, nuke this planet from orbit and salt the ashes type strikes. Actually, their strikes just literally blow up the entire planet because fuck that orbiting rock. Um, yeah, they're scary, scary, scary bastards. And they are involved in this. Turns out neither side, neither the town or the Imperium, want to fight a war on this planet because it's worthless. It's a piece of junk. Nobody wants all their soldiers to die for this worthless rock. So, but somebody keeps pushing them towards war and they're freaked out and they need to figure it out. So the Inquisition gets involved and they, the Inquisition uh, Inquisitor, Inquisitor Amberly Vale, who, spoiler, uh, Kane met earlier as the singing girl the entertainment at the diplomatic party and kind of half fell in love with her did not expect her to be an imperial agent um she determines that something's going down they had found some meeting places underneath the city she gets kane his his wonderful assistant jurgen uh with his his trademark melt a gun which just shoots heat at a thing until it melts tanks um, and five condemned prisoners who had started a giant fight 
early earlier on board when the 597 was still gelling and had got had fucked people bad enough had fucked people up bad enough to uh basically earn the death penalty so they're suicide squad except if they make it through they get pardoned and back into the regular troops they go down to the city they find out it's not the tau and the imperium fighting each other it's the tyranid as infiltration specialists a fifth columnist group trying to get the tau and the imperium to fight so that they'll be weak for an impending tyranid takeover um things go sideways in the tunnel lots of action lots of people getting shot uh they end up teaming up with a tau group for a while and uh you know they both agree okay we need to get our this information back to our people we can't kill each other over this evil bug plan um let's work together in the classic tradition of you know enemy mine your enemy the enemy of my enemy is my friend type thing and it's a real bright moment till they all get killed um kane makes his way back out along with amberly vale and eventually jurgen they find the leader of the tyranids they kill it they kill uh spoilers they kill the fat governor who as it turns out was a tyranid all the time and he's the one who shot the ambassador they stop the war the tyranid the tau agree to pull back and basically let the imperium have this planet until they get lazy and you know stop paying attention and then they'll take it <clears throat> And the final real act is uh, a couple of the troopers that Kane thought had died get found. And they're real groggy, but apparently they, and confused, but somehow they fought off the Tyranid and made their way out. And Kane looks at him for a second. And then he pulls out his gun and shoots them both in the head. Because that is a classic symptom, symptom of a Tyranid implantation to change your genetics and make you start breeding Tyranids and basically control you and use you as an infiltrator. And sure enough, he finds the wounds in their torsos that are traditional Tyranid implant points. And yep, they were tainted. They had to be shot. They didn't even know they were tainted. Very, very sad. But people understand. And then he sees a couple of the uh, the Tau soldiers that he was pretty sure were all dead. And they made it out too somehow. And they're groggy. And they're injured in the torso. And Kane starts to do something and the Inquisitor stops him. And she just looks happy, you know. Hey, if it fucks up our enemy, let it fuck up our enemy. And Kane's kind of sad. But he goes on with life because, you know, hey, it's the Imperium of Man. It's a dystopic nightmare. There is no good ending. Uh, so victory, kind of, at least for now. And Kane proceeds to, uh, from thence on, be a sometime agent of the Inquisition and keep getting into trouble. But yeah, that's the story. It's a it's a good story. It's a great read. It's a lot of fun. I will say the Caiaphas Kane story. I love me some Warhammer 40K, some good old-fashioned ultraviolence, uh, big honking space marines doing big honking space marine things with chain swords and epic drama and heroic sacrifice and roar, manly. Many a manly tear is shed. Uh, Caiaphas Kane, these novels are the only really funny ones in the 40K universe. And as over the top and satirical as the universe is, it deserves some funny. I, I totally love the Grimdark too. I love the seriousness, but you need to have some levity in there from time to time. Can Sandy Mitchell's Caiaphas Kane stories are really some of the best example of that. So what is this all about? Well, the background. Um, amongst other things, Caiaphas Kane is the traditional, very much the traditional anti-hero. He is a coward. He is a poltroon. He is a conniving, sneaking weasel who's doing his level best to not get shot. Um, most of his decisions are... are um, I lost the word there. He's basically... Yeah, everything is about his desire to survive as easily and quickly and comfortably as possible. Um, and yet he still somehow manages to uh, sneak in some heroism by the back roads, which we'll get to later. He is based very heavily on a character known as Harry Flashman, who was, uh, I forget the author, but was a British Imperial officer in the, uh, it was written in the 70s, it was set in the 1870s? No, 1840s, I think. Um, basically, when Britain was colonizing uh, Afghanistan and India. And he is a an utter coward and a worthless soldier and a complete loser 
who keeps stumbling into victory and, you know, being confused as somebody heroic and taking all the credit and the glory. Don't read it. Don't don't read the Harry Flashman series. It's real bad, y'all. Like, not quality-wise, but I credit where it's due, I'm pretty sure the author was trying to make an unlikable bastard of a character as an anti-hero and to, like, expose the horribleness of the British military and society of the time. And he really succeeds. Uh, the character casually rapes a woman. He's just, you know, offhandedly racist. Uh, it's, and so the, uh, one of the, at one point he get, talks about getting kicked out of a prestigious private school as a kid to a commanding officer who also get, got kicked out. And, well, what did they kick you out for? Uh, drunkenness, sir. Drunkenness, my God, they'll be kicking you out for rape next. And, and again, it's, I'm pretty sure the author was trying to make you uncomfortable and bothered. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it really, really succeeds with no real redeeming qualities. As opposed to Caiaphas Cain, who is not a rapist and is not racist. He's just a coward and not even that much of a coward. He just wants to live uh, and really doesn't want to fight a bunch of people who are trying to hurt him. But he is actually heroic. He is actually a decent guy. Um, you know, it's there's layers of coward and self-preservation in there, but he's a good guy underneath. So of the two, definitely read Caiaphas Cain. Um, avoid Harry Flashman. Again, well-written. I'm pretty sure he succeeded in his intent, but damn, it's uncomfortable. But um, another thing that I noticed uh, rereading this some time ago, especially if, for those of you who are of my age or older, those of you who were alive in the early 2000s and remember, you know, this, the fear of suddenly, oh, these infiltrators who could be anywhere in our society and they look like Americans, but they're not. They're secretly plotting to overthrow us and to cause chaos and to do all this shit. And we expect our society, our soldiers to be welcomed as champions and heroes, freeing the people. And instead they get rocks thrown at them and explosions set off. And these foreign cultures that we're fighting and these hidden, there's a lot, there is heavily, uh, heavy stuff about the war on terror and the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, especially the early years. Um, at least that's what I think. I've never spoken to Sandy Mitchell, so I don't know, but I think there was a lot of rip from the headlines type stuff, um, at least informing the atmosphere of this. So yeah, that's another influence. Um, so as far as the themes, one of the biggest one of the major, major themes is things are not what they seem. From the introduction, which is, the introduction is written by Amberly Vale. She's the one who is uh, like collating his memoirs after his death uh, and not letting anybody see them outside of the Inquisition because, wow, they can't let a, everybody know a hero of the Imperium was a coward. Um, But you see that, you see the name, and, but when you're reading it, you don't really associate that with, you know, pretty blonde woman because Amberly could be feminine, but it's 40K space names. They're all over the place. Um, so it's a bit of a shock when suddenly the Inquisitor turns out to be the singing, the singer, you know, the sultry crooner woman. Um, some of my fellow Inquisitors may be shocked to discover that one of the Imperium's most venerated heroes was by his own admission, a scoundrel and self-seeking rogue. You get that things not as what not that what they seem with the Tyranids, with the with Amberly Vale, uh, with Jurgen. I'm not going to spoil that bit. It's a, a minor detail, but it's it's there. Jurgen is more than he seems. Um, the Tyranids. I think I said that. And and Cain. He seems to be a hero, and yet by his own admission is a coward. But then. Is he really a reliable narrator? Can we trust words Cain's word about himself? You know, if a liar tells you that he's a liar, what do you do with that? Indeed, I would go so far as to contend that it was this very combination of character flaws which made him one of the most effective servants the Imperium has ever had, despite his strenuous efforts to the contrary. <clears throat> And again, uh, and this is all from the introduction. This is all page 32 before the novel even started. Well, the novel started, but in fairness, it should also be pointed out here that Cain is his own harshest critic, often going out of his way 
to deny that the many instances in which he appears, despite his professed baser motives, to have acted primarily out of loyalty or altruism were any such thing. So yeah, Cain is definitely an unreliable narrator, especially when it comes to himself. He he claims he's a coward. The universe claim or the galaxy, the Imperium claims he's a hero. It's up to us to figure out what he is. And my argument is that he's a hero. He's just kind of the self-serving anti-heroish hero. He and he's not even that self-serving. You know, he helps the Imperium. He just wants to have a cushy job while he does it and stay safe and enjoy the nicer things. Which, hey, fair play to you. So yeah, it's it's a fun novel. Um, so again, things are not what they seem. At one point, the singer tells him, no one here is entirely, sir, entirely what they seem, Commissar. You can certainly depend on that. So again, Kane himself, Amberly Vale, the Tyranids, it is, it's, it's a recurrent thing. Um, and that, that kind of seems to be a thing in a lot of the Caiaphas Kane stories. Looks like one problem on the surface is actually something else underneath. Usually Tyranid, or Orcs, or Necron. Tyranid and Necron, usually, they're, they're the kind of scary ones. Another thing, hero or rogue. Then a truly horrifying thought struck me. I'd been the one who set fire to the building. If the Inquisition thought I'd been responsible for the death of one of their own and had just stood by and let him burn without even trying to rescue him, I'd be a dead man, if I was lucky. So he, uh, when he meets Amberly Vale as the Inquisitor, they're going to check out a, a trouble spot on the map. They find out some local, local yokel type militia have been pinned down by unknown enemies. And so using his vehicle, Kane uses the flamethrower, lights it on fire. And then finds out that's the building that the Inquisition team went into earlier and went down in the tunnels. So yeah, he might have just cooked an Inquisitor alive, and that will get him very dead. So he rushes into the burning building, you know, guns blazing, taking out him. You know, they rush in in the vehicle. They're somewhat smarter. Uh, taking out enemy cultists left and right and manage to save most of the Inquisitorial team. Just a couple goons get downed. And so, yeah, uh, is it... Is it heroic? I mean, it's a heroic rescue. He bursts into a burning building and takes down a squad of pursuers to, to help the good guys. But he does it to save his own damn neck. But then, you know, um, how many people think of war? How many people kill, a, kill the enemy or take the objective because they're just terrified and the bastards are trying to kill them? So you got to kill them before they kill you. Um, and cowardice lead to, to heroism. Like even in even in history, that's that's what a commissar does. You're more afraid of your own side than you are of the enemy. You know, I charge the enemy guns, I'll probably die. I retreat into the commissars, I will certainly die. So, you know, when you're, as another Kane story puts it, when your only chance of survival is charging a broken a carnifex with a broken chair leg, you charge the carnifex. So I think that's a an interesting evaluation of heroism. I think it's really important in a world that has grown darker and that has grown cynical about our pure iterations of heroism. And God knows I love pure heroes, the paragons, but we do live in a it, the world is not pure. So can we still have a hero even if he's a coward? I think so, but I'm a big fan. Other themes, um, cooperation between the Tau and the Empire, between men and women, that's a big one, and between the noble and the common. Uh, Jürgen, the, the commissar, the hero, I'm sorry, Kane, the commissar, the hero, and Jürgen, the unprepossessing line trooper who has an interesting collection of body odors and uh, dermatological issues. And is just kind of generally vile. So, yeah, um, cooperation, and that's that's even the theme that it kind of kind of ends on. Um, that the reminder that yeah, this is a dystopia. This is a nightmare scenario. This is the worst possible worlds. So they have that moment when Cain could have stopped the Tau. He could have killed those troopers and say, or you know, at least told them, hey. These guys are infected and like maybe actually started the first steps of a combination, a, a unity, or at least a respectful 
peace. But instead, they they go back to their bigotry and their bias and their their hate. And it's sad. And you, I think you're supposed to feel sad. I think it's supposed to be a, da- a bit of a downer. You know, yeah, the hero won, but this is not a world that allows for real heroism. Um, girl power. Again, this is... I was going to say, oh, this is the early 2000s. It's a different time, but no, it's not. Um, women still get the short end of the stick for no fucking reason whatsoever. But, yeah, you get... Uh, it's like Colonel Castine, who's in charge of the 597. That is half men who don't want to play with the girls with cooties, at least until they get the unit together and like start respecting each other as soldiers. Somebody says, you know, they're trying to stop the the Tau and the Empire from going to war. And we're too late. It sounds as though the war's already started. Then we'll just have to stop it, she said matter-of-factly. If ever a woman seemed capable of stopping an all-out war single-handedly, it was her. So yeah, um, the the women are often the commanders. They're the ones charging to the rescue. There are also men commanders. Um, and, you know, this is the 40th, 40, 41st millennia. All the humanity cares about is, can you hold a gun and will you die for your emperor? And and your answer to the last one is yes, whether you will it or no. Um, so, yeah, there is there's really, well... There is no ideological difference between men and women. There are individuals and groups who have stupid prejudices, but there are also lots of groups with big honking guns that will prove them wrong. That's one of my favorite things about uh, 40K. Yeah, Try being racist against brown people. See how the De- Talarn Desert Raiders take that. They have very they have very more guns than you. Um, yeah. But again, it's... I think that... Uh, and I think that that's... Sandy Mitchell playing with the world of Warhammer 40k. It is very uh, androcentric. It is very male dominated. It's about big manly men, space marines, and women can't be space marines because cooties. I mean, that's that's pretty much the reason girls girls have cooties. Um, yeah. So and don't come bitching to me about the sisters of battle. I know about them. It's still a bullshit reason that only men can be space marines because the emperor decided why the fuck not. You know, Malkador the Sigilite even said, you should make them women. The female of the species is often a lot scarier. You know, bears, lions, tigers, pretty much anything. The female will fuck you up first. But the emperor, you know, was 10,000-year-old man who had 10,000-year-old 10, man views. Anyway, the point. Uh, girls, girls rule. And, you know, you go, girl. They kick a lot of ass. Uh, even the annoying one, uh, Lieutenant Sulla, you find out that she becomes one of the few lady generals uh, and a, a massive tank commander and is a badass. She Well, she's obnoxious, but all the other women are badasses. So, yeah. Um, so, scripture. What does this mean for us? How can we use this to better our lives? How is this authoritative? I fucking love Caiaphas Cain. Because it is a how-to manual on, a, on being a manipulative bastard for fun and profit. How to be your, basically your worst, most self-serving self, but in a way that is useful and beneficial to others and even makes you look like a good guy. Um, I am all about that. I am all about the back roads to virtue. So at, at one point, the fight that I mentioned where the, the several soldiers get uh, put on suicide squad duty... Basically, they're in the mess hall in on the ship, and somebody uses it's like founding day for the women's regiment, and so they use their regimental uh, ceram silverware and plates and such as a foundation day celebration, and some of the men say something about uh, not eating on any on any frilly little tea sets, and a fight starts, and several people get killed. Kane rushes in with a bunch of uh, ship troopers and you know ship security officers. They charge into the fray and immediately get swamped by the mob. And Kane is about to back out, back the fuck out the door and call for backup. When one of the troopers shouts out, Commissar, help! And all eyes turn to him. And he freezes. And he says to himself, If you take one more step towards that door, I told myself, you're a dead man. They'd be on me in seconds. The only way to survive was to take them by surprise. So I stepped forward instead as though I'd just entered the room. You, 
I pointed at a random trooper. Get a broom. That was not a request. This mess hall is an absolute disgrace. And he just starts shouting at them about cleaning up the mess as if it was just a regular day. And that breaks the tension and they just go, oh, shit, 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 get them up. Uh, quick, hide the knives. And, you know, trying to cover things up. And it's, A, it is a great example of control. Take the advantage. Take the tempo. Take your opponent by surprise. Do what they don't expect. And that is usually the way to survive. Um, also, if you act like it's just a normal everyday thing, like nothing is out of the ordinary, people kind of pick up on that. I, I don't know why. It's just kind of a something about our pack mentality that, okay, the leader is unfazed, therefore everything must be fine. So yeah, um, great example. And he does this throughout the novel. Another instance, he's talking to Castine right before the party and she's nervous and she's, you know, she's a new colonel. She was like a, a lieutenant before all the tyranny to ate all of her command structure above her. Um, so he says to her, <clears throat> you are one of the youngest regimental commanders in the entire guard, a position that, in my opinion, you hold entirely on merit. And my confidence is not lightly earned. It was what she needed to hear, of course. I've always been good at manipulating people. That's one of the reasons I'm so good at my job. And and the thing is, he's he's exaggerating for effect. He's telling her what she needs to hear to be confident and to do her job well. But he does mean it, or at least most of it. He respects her. He likes her. He you know she's impressive. Uh, so he's just reminding her of that he's helping her put her best foot forward. The fact that he's being a manipulative bastard into the offing doesn't mean it's not true. It doesn't mean it's not helpful. She actually conducts herself very well at the party. And once she goes sideways, does even better. Um, so yeah, it's... People don't like liars. People don't like manipulators. But if you're smart, if you do it right, enlightened self-interest can make you a better person, damn it. If you just use your fucking brain and look at the options, usually virtue is the smart choice. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to be virtuous at heart. It just means you have to be smart enough to know where your interests lie. And then there's cooperation. And again, it's that uh, that last scene that I've talked about already where, yeah. As I turned away, sick with apprehension, I found Amberly watching me with what I can only describe as a smile of satisfaction. For some reason, I failed to raise my spirits. If anything, it had quite the opposite effect. So yeah, this is a grim dark world. And and grim dark is by by all means an exaggeration. It's you turn the dial up to 20 and, and break the knob off. Um but we live in a shitty world things don't go right. I think, I think what this means for us, I think our takeaway is that you have to be intentional. You have to make the choice. Cooperation doesn't just happen. Things don't just work out right. You have to make an active choice to be better, to be your best self, to see that cooperation and unity and, and diversity of thought and power and all that stuff, that we're better together, that we don't have to fight each other for stupid, worthless reasons. You know, um, so I, I think that's the one of the big takeaways. So yeah, cooperate, find a reason to trust and work together, even with your enemies, you know, extend the fucking olive branch. And then be a bastard, but use your damn brain and be a bastard for the greater good. I think those are our two big takeaways. Um, I think those are the two kind of scriptural aspects of it. And like I said, I absolutely love Caiaphas Cain. Um, I'll probably finish doing the short story recordings just because I want to and it's fun. And then I'll, uh, I probably won't do any more sermon type things or uh, pop scriptures on any of Cain's stories. Unless I just reread re one and, you know, get, hey, this is great. Uh, but these are these are common themes, and it's a really, really good series. Go out and read it or listen to the audiobooks. They're fantastic. Um, but other than that, thanks for dropping by. 
learn from anything and learn from everything. Take care.